I'm I'm just push this uh, live stream thing just now. <clears throat> All right, Matthew chapter 7, got a real slim crowd today, we have people traveling on um, holiday travels, I guess. This is uh, part four in the series, and the series covers uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 29, which is the end of the chapter. Um, this is part two from last week, which is Beware of False Prophets. Let's see if I can turn my sound off because these notifications... I can't do it. Well, yeah, there it is. There we go. Um... Beware of False Prophets, Part 2, Matthew Series, Chapter 7, Part 4. Verse 13 is where we start reading. Go in through the narrow gate, for because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go in through it. Because narrow is the gate and constricted is the way, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Here's the verse we're going to continue on this week. Beware of false prophets, verse 15, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inward, inwardly are ravening or ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out, uh, prophesy in your name, and, and through your name cast out demons, and through your name do many wonderful works? And then I will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me those working lawlessness." Now, last week we started examining verse 15, um, Beware False Prophets, Part 1. You can go back and, and look at that if you'd like. Uh, just a little bit of review here about that. We looked at the word beware in its context here in chapter 7 and showed its use in other texts of perceived positivity and, or negativity in other texts, especially when we looked at when other English words are used, translated from the same original Greek word that here is translated beware. So in other texts, you see things like uh, take heed, uh, give attention, uh, have regard. So these things can be positive. One text we went to was in Acts where it talked about people were listening to Philip preach and they were um, giving attention or taking heed to what he said. So that's a positive thing in, in the minds of the hearers and even us when we read it. And here beware is, um, of course it ends up being a positive thing, but it's dealing with something that is perceived negative. But even as even in our perception, I hope after today what we talk about maybe kind of evens that out, and um, it's still positive because God's saying it. 
and, and you'll see as we go along. So we ended up <clears throat> addressing also some things concerning making judgments, which were always important to be able to know what that means and even how to do it the right way. We've been talking about this for years. So this has to do with the basic essence of discernment, discerning things, understanding things, see how they fit together, and um, making a biblical judgment based on an understanding of God's clear truth, the meaning, that's the idea, the meaning of what's being said, which of course requires an interpretation of what's being said, and that involves teaching, and in our context, the false prophets that we're bewaring are these false teachers. So we have to know all these things. So remembering all that, all the while, we have to keep in mind what I keep telling us, we have to keep in the forefront of our mind that this is all about Christ. It's all about His honor, His worthiness, His fame, His reputation, right? And if we have Him as our Lord and Savior and Master and Mediator, Substitute, Representative, Propitiation, our Advocate, on and on and all these things He is to us, we should be on heightened alert to want to honor, worship, praise, defend, and love his character. And that's what this is all about. This is not a theological sport. It's just not something intriguing or intellectually stimulating to think about. It should, it should be those things, but that's, that's not the focus. So we have spent time in many other <clears throat> occasions talking about the detail of the how and the why that this is a responsibility to, to beware, in other words, is a responsibility. We've emphasized the importance, again, in doing this properly, not just according to gospel doctrine, but doing it in a proper attitude that has to do with fairness, patience, love, humility, and so on. So judging, and this is what we have to do in this text here where it says beware of false prophets. If, if we're told to do this, and this is not a suggestion, this is, this is a mandate, this is what we must do, and if you think it's not important, just go ahead and don't do it and see how much trouble comes in your life, in your own personal life and the life of the church. But as we do it, we have to make a judgment. We know that a false teacher is not a believer, so that we have to do this carefully and wisely. And we, so we emphasize not only doing it proper in doctrine, but in attitude. So there's a basis upon which we judge, right? We don't judge by outward appearance. We don't judge by, you know, maybe some other uh, preconceived bias that might appeal to us, whether it be a clique, a club, a tradition, um, you know, what, they, uh, what this person is to us outside of the gospel. Um, you know, if there's a friendship outside of the gospel, maybe even before the gospel came along, um, that could skew judgment. You know, you don't want to judge. Uh, you know, I've known this guy for years. Uh, you know, how can it be a false prophet? I've known him for, you know, 35, 40 years. How can it be? We've done this together. We've done this together. Maybe somebody's related to a person and there's bias. There's all kinds of things that could skew judgment, and we have to clear those things out of the way because these personal things um, can influence us, and we have to be careful because the truth is more important than these other connections. The truth is more important, again, than we are, than anybody is. Which means Christ, who is the truth, is more important than we are. So we must submit to His Word in these things. We talked about and stressed how that teachers and preachers are at a higher um, accountability level when it comes to what they say. I even honed in on this and, and referred to uh, authors, you know, those that would write theological doctrinal information, 
Um, and then those that would, I even just said, look, it, it, it goes back on the congregation or anybody listening to this um, recording that um, it claims to be a believer in this gospel as they witness to people, as they are ambassadors for Christ, as they say things representing who God is and, and what he has done, it's not a game. It's serious. And if you want to misrepresent God, uh, you're, going to, you're going to be in trouble. So assigning characteristics of God that aren't there or removing characteristics of God that are there is the action of creating in real time idolatry. So, which means you would turn God into a false God. That, that would be a representation of him, promoting idolatry which would be a misrepresentation, which is where we come up when we see other Gospels. So, it's important. So it has to be discerning, judging the right way, connected with those that profess with their mouth or confess what they believe uh, in front of people. And we talked about how it even goes all the way to Facebook posts. You know, a lot of people, they'll put up um, Scripture, and that's it. And that's probably safe. But when you add commentary to it, if it's not your commentary, if it's someone else's commentary added to it, you can't be responsible to be doing that. That's why I'm finding less and less people to put up quotes about, because a lot of people, even some of the older dead guys, from centuries past, or you see inconsistencies, you don't want to promote that inconsistency. So, anyone hearing a teacher must check if that teacher has biblical authority and they're interpreting the scripture right and telling the truth according to God's word in the context of our, of our text in Matthew 7. This is what it deals with. And it's primarily uh, doctrine. It doesn't have anything to do, I don't think, with um, immorality. And we can get into that about false prophet versus uh, a true uh, one that's telling the truth about the gospel. If you're going to look at character and conduct to judge whether or not one's a true preacher or a false preacher, um, then you slip into even though elders and bishops and deacons and, and, and all these people have qualifications, and you're not supposed to um, ordain a, a novice because of what can go wrong there, you could slide into a judging saved and lost by the law rather than the gospel. One example real quick, um, the prophet David, who was king, this one that wrote many of the Psalms, um, are you going to judge him a false prophet because he had um, sexual intercourse with Bathsheba? Who knows how many times? We know it was at least once, and then he had her husband killed. Is he a false prophet because he had this affair? Is that the way? This is a man after God's own heart. Um, if you demand that from him, you're, you know, as far as qualified qualifications, you're, you're probably in trouble yourself because we know in the Sermon on the Mount, we pressed it a, a week or two ago about the spiritualization of the law, the magnification of the law. It's not just those who, according to the letter of law, have physically committed adultery, but those who, even in their heart, have looked and lusted. So nobody's qualified. See how this works. So, before we go on to the next section in uh, verse 15, we need to get our minds fixed on something here that I think should help us with our own, our own sanity and interpretation and um, so we don't get frazzled or distressed about some of these things that are in the Scripture that, uh, and some people might not even thought about this, but let's see what you think. And it's pretty simple, and I always ask people to keep all these things together at the same time to multitask, and you need to practice doing that. But here's what I want to say about that. And I ran out of time to say it last week. But in the absolute sovereignty of God, 
We know he's sovereign in all things without exception. In his purpose, in creation, in providence, in salvation, in judgment, all these things. He's, he has preeminence, he's in control, he's absolutely sovereign. And also in like double predestination, reprobation, all those things. Everything without exception. We have to see how that there are some things that work together, two things that work together that seem like they may oppose themselves, but they work together um, in God's purpose. And we have to keep them both in mind at the same time, or at least if you can't do that, take turns thinking about them and don't forget three seconds from when you switch. But here they are. God has appointed certain people to be false teachers in just about every generation that the earth has existed. And we could think of even the garden. Adam and Eve was there. Who else was there? The serpent. Some, some people that call themselves preachers that have degrees behind their name have said they, can, they don't understand why God would allow sin to come into the world. I mean, this is pretty basic. It's pretty basic. Um, when you hear that, you start asking questions. I mean, the guy that I heard say that at a conference a few years back was, uh, he had a PhD. And um, don't know why he was speaking, but he said he didn't understand why God would allow sin to come into the world. You would start thinking about what are some of the questions you want to ask. Did this sin surprise God? You know, that's just the beginning. So we can go on. God has appointed false teachers. He has purposed them. He's appointed them. He's predestinated them. Everything about them, their training, the people they're associated to, who that they tell their lies to, everything. Secondly, God has a people, an elect group of individuals who were unconditionally chosen in Christ. We... Um, we know this, and this was done before the world began. We did a 51-part series on Chosen in Christ. We've gone into the detail about that, and part of it was had to do with evangelism, with, which is what I'm getting at here. I'm trying to encourage everyone as they preach and teach, and they're preaching the truth as clear as they can, and then they're opposing false prophets at the very same time that all these things have to be remembered in your head and they'll be helpful. We know this, that the elect sheep will hear the true gospel. They will be given faith to believe it. They will be given repentance to reject their own righteousness. And any message that defended a false Christ, a conditional salvation, a grace plus works, um, a law keeping for a righteous, anything like that, a works righteousness gospel, they will repent from that. God is, God will not fail in giving them faith to believe the truth and to reject the lie. He can handle it. He's promised he'll do it. He has does it. He has done it and he'll continue to do it. So this is evidence when a person goes through this experience and you see the evidence of belief in Christ and a rejection of what they formerly held to, their former idolatry and, and dead works and self-righteousness. This is evidence that they have heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a promise. My sheep, they're going to hear his voice and they'll follow him. So this is the, this is the result or the effect of um, the effectual work of the Spirit in the believer through the means of the gospel of Christ through the power of the Spirit. And again, it's about His honor, His glory, His, his accomplished redemption, His reputation. It's all there. Now, the, again, the twofold purpose of the gospel, many, many people reject this, even some that claim to be Sovereign Grace Reformed Calvinists, that the gospel goes out without fail. When I say without fail, even if it doesn't convert or cause one to believe is a means to cause one to believe and repent, it goes out for a different reason to the non-elect. 
So to the elect, it brings life. It's the means to bring life in the hands of the Spirit. Uh, life is knowing God. This is life eternal, John 17, 3, that you may know Him, the only true God and the Lord Jesus Christ whom He has sent. And with that, of course, is contained an understanding. He has given you an understanding, 1 John 5, 20, that we may know Him, the only true God. Secondly, when the gospel goes out to the non-elect, it is a, a savor unto death, as it says in the King James. It's, it's death. In other words, more condemnation is heaped on and piled on, and it, and it is a means to harden that person. And there's other really strong texts, like in uh, 2 Thessalonians, it talks about God sending strong delusions so that they may believe a lie. There's other texts that talks about God blinding and hardening, and so on. Uh, so those texts are in place. So when that gospel goes out, it will not fail. It does one of those two things. It will be a means to save, or it will be a means to harden. So we should not um, be mixed up in the results. That's none of our business. We plant in other waters. God gives the increase. We're not involved in the increase. So God's chosen sheep of God, the, the elect, vessels of mercy and vessels of honor have always been sheep. Anybody that's a sheep has always been a sheep. They've always been loved by God in Christ eternally. But those that are lost sheep, they're lost until they are found by the great shepherd in that day of their salvation. They'll be given spiritual life and faith to hear his voice and follow him. But on the other hand, the non-elect are goats. They've always been goats. They've always been non-elect. They've never been loved. They're vessels of wrath, vessels of destruction, and they're never going to believe, ever. And we cannot anticipate who these people are until and unless they believe. You can't call one a non-elect that's still alive and breathing. You can't call them a reprobate. A lot of people have a habit of doing that. Um, it's going on right now. Some people call me uh, a non-elect, unbelieving reprobate. So, um, they're advanced to a certain level to uh, do what the Scripture I think, doesn't allow us to do. So here's the importance here to see. When, when I say all this, the importance to see, and I want to say one more thing. Uh, some lost sheep, before they believe, were false teachers. Right? God can and will and has saved false teachers. And after they're saved, they're no longer false teachers. But... Saying all that, here it's important to see this uh, teaching of repentance. A change of mind of what one had counted on and, and had their hope in in times past. Now, God has given a new mind, given a new heart, has revealed the truth, and now has given faith and repentance, and they will, God's people will flush the dung that they counted on, everything they had invested in before that thought recommended them to God in any way, shape, or form. And it shows a repentance. And it has a distinct line of like, before this point, I believed a lie, and now I believe the truth. And everybody should have uh, some type of a, a clear confession or a profession concerning that. You don't have to know the um, very day and hour. Uh, it should start with like right now, for example. You know, I, I know what I believe now, and I know I didn't used to believe that, but it's helpful, um, especially in the mind of others, and especially if you're a teacher or a preacher, to have some form of a more concise idea of, of your conversion 
story or experience based on the scripture in, in real history of your life. Um, if that is tossed aside, if that's hidden, if that's uh, skewed, if somebody says that's not important, you know, to, to talk about what you used to believe versus what you believe, and if they say it's important, it's not important to say when, uh, I don't agree. I think it's important, and it has to do with our text, as a matter of fact. Now, we're going to get into a little bit later, maybe not today, but there's levels of um, subtlety, because it's going to talk about here in a little while, false prophets that come in sheep's clothing. I'm trying to kind of examine some things I haven't before and say some things I don't normally repetitively say, um, especially for those that listen a lot to my teaching, um, try to keep it, um, not change it, but keep it fresh in the way that I explain things uh, using more text than other texts and making more connections. Um, so there are levels of subtlety in dealing with the sheep's clothing thing. And there's a, the point that I just made about one's conversion date is tied to that. So what I'm getting at is um, God, he predestinates, ordains, and appoints false teachers for his purpose. And at the same time, he calls on people to defend his truth against the lies of those same false teachers. Some people have a hard time taking that all in together at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure why. And even those that maybe haven't had a hard time sometimes tend to forget and I'm not saying I haven't forgotten. I mean, I'm not perfect. I, I do it all the time where you're talking to somebody and you forget some of the things I'm going to name here in a second about that. So in other words, this is not necessarily a mystery. If we can get these two things together in our mind at the same time, we'll see the whole thing is positive and it's not really confusing. And really, as we grow and mature, there's a sense in which it should not even be discouraging. Uh, because this is God that does it, and we should like trust Him. He's doing the right thing for His own glory. So it's related to these things that we always talk about, and primarily here it is. Number one, we are not the Holy Spirit. As we preach and teach, you know, we will either get excited or aggravated. And sometimes we'll get excited too soon or aggravated too soon because we try to anticipate a conversion. And we can't do it. We can't do it. So we're not the Holy Spirit. We can't get in people's minds and change their minds. That's God's business. Number two, we cannot forget that those that we are talking to that do not believe yet, we can't forget that they are in the state of total depravity, which means they're not a believer. They're not justified. They are not regenerate. They don't have the mind of Christ. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness to them and they don't understand them. So these are the things that we have to remember because we get excited and we see like they're picking up on some stuff. I think they're getting close. And then we try to act like the Holy Spirit and maybe we can craft it a certain way. And how come you're not believing this? I'm saying this as clear as I can. Remember total depravity. They're spiritually dead. They cannot respond positively spiritually because they need life. I can't give life. All I can do is preach the gospel, which is the means that the Spirit of God uses to give life. Thirdly, this weird thing about numbers. We already looked closely about the few versus the many. But the pressure of people um, in reference to these numbers and um, looking at a ministry or an individual, whether it be a church member or a, a teacher or a preacher, of um, how many notches do you have on your belt? You know, these type of things, pressing about numbers. Even, a, even we look at the many versus the few, we realize in each generation there's few. And then you find a church that 
preaches the truth and there's few. And then on a holiday, when people are missing, how many do you think there are? Do you think there's more? <laughs> no, there's less. So this numbers thing invades our minds and we need to get that out of our minds. Fourthly, we cannot, and I alluded to this earlier, we cannot be, the, be final in anything in reference to individuals that we're dealing with, whether they're elect or not elect, as long as they're still alive. And then fifthly, doctrine, in connection with our text, doctrine affects practice, and practice can reveal false doctrine. Often, oftentimes, I'd say most of the times it does. So if you can keep all those things in mind at the same time, the gospel goes out for two reasons, to convert and to harden. And then all these things in our mind about when you're dealing with people um, and discerning how we deal in an evangelistic sense, these things that I just mentioned. Let's go to Jude. Uh, there's only one chapter in Jude. That's a common joke. Some people say, what chapter? Verse 3 and 4 is what I want to look at. These are maybe the most popular verses in Jude. We've looked at them before, but this is a, sort of a proof text in the context of our study. And it shows both of these things I was talking about, what the Word of God does, and it shows Lazica out here, kind of the purpose of God here. And if you can see these two popular verses in their context, it'll be helpful. And it's what I said in our introduction. Verse 3, having made all haste to write to you about the common salvation, beloved, I had need to write to you to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith, the faith of the gospel, the message, once delivered to the saints. In other words, the original gospel. Don't move away from that original gospel. Contend for it. Preach it. Defend it. Love it. Why? Verse 4, for or because... Notice the words, certain men crept in. You, you know the language there. It reminds us of, um, of um, the one text in Corinthians about the subtlety there as Eve was deceived. It reminds us of uh, Galatians 1, which if we have time we're going to go to today when it talks about the false gospel. About Men came in, false brethren came in by stealth. That's the idea there. For certain men crept in, crept in. This is the sheep's clothing idea. Crept in how? Secretly. There's another uh, creepy word. Those have, it's modern King James here. Those having been of old previously written, uh, before of old ordained, I think it's uh, King James says, which means appointed, unto this condemnation, previously written into this condemnation, already set up by the purpose of God, specific certain men to do this certain thing around and among the elect. This is the because, the first word because in verse 4, do this in verse 3 because there's these other people doing this other. Here we see the truth and the lie, we see the antithesis of the gospel at work alongside of the gospel. So when we warn people, that's the value of the antithesis, the opposite, where we preach the truth and expose the lie. And if someone says that's not of any value, uh, I would steer clear as far away as you can because this is a, this is a, this is a downplaying of the offense of the cross if this takes place. Let's go to another text I was referring to, 1 Corinthians 11. Actually, this is not the same one, but it's, it's related to what we're talking about. Now, here in this um, chapter, it's dealing with the Lord's Supper, which is about practice, but this can be applied um, in doctrine, and pretty much the last two verses are, are related to this in doctrine. But 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18. If 
First of all, when you come together, it's referring to the Lord's Supper here uh, in this context, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I partly believe it. You remember he already dealt with uh, them to a certain extent about the divisions that were going on about them picking preacher favorites and starting cliques and clubs and stuff and, you know, that ridiculousness. That's what he started out that letter with. He says this, and this is why I brought us here, for there must also be heresies among you so that the approved ones may be revealed among you. So there's these uh, opinions that are associated with lies among the people. The idea of heresies, tied, the definitional tie has to do with one's own opinion that is uh, either being raised above the truth, their spin on it, you know, which is divisive, which could go into um, secondary issues versus primary issues and so on. But that's the idea, like, you're setting your opinion over the truth of the Word of God, and you're dividing. God said there must be these things among God's people, at least people associated with God's people at least, so that those that are telling the truth may be made known to the other believers. Like, this guy's saying the right thing. As long as he honors God's Word, we should follow this guy. This guy here is lying about this issue. Therefore, beware. Uh, whether it be a, a, a method or an attitude, and this is kind of getting close to that in this text here. Uh, you remember all the problems in the Church of Corinth where they were having respect of persons. They weren't waiting on people at the Lord's Supper. They were actually getting drunk before people got there, which is pretty much over the top. And they're saying this is a serious thing. Um, don't act, you know, walk worthy in this thing. Don't partake unworthily in the remembrance meal of the Lord's Supper. But this, of course, can be applied doctrinally, and it is in other places. So the question um, I asked last week, or was asked, I'm sorry, was asked last week at the end of the message had to do with um, whether some of these false teachers, as they maneuver and do things and, and work their stuff, are they doing it to gain a crowd? What is the motive? Is it a power thing? Is it a money thing? Is it a purposely deceiving thing, like they know they're wrong and they're going to deceive on purpose? You know, wittingly or unwittingly is the question. And, if, and of course, in the long run, it doesn't matter because sincerity doesn't replace the truth. And even if one is deceived and they're trying to do what they think is right and say things they think are right, they're still deceived and that doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't make them, quote unquote, saved. God doesn't cut them a break because they thought they were telling the truth. We know the guy in our text in Matthew 7, he said he was objecting to the judgment cast upon him. He said, but he had a plea. But Lord, Lord, didn't I, this is my plea, didn't I do these things? Isn't this the evidence that I had my assurance in because I was doing these things? You know, he was sincere. He was as honest as he thought he could be with himself and with others. And he was zealous. He was fervent. He wasn't playing. This, this guy was a go-getter. Spent a lot of time, energy, and money in religion. But he was deceived all the way up until the Day of Judgment. So whether one does... I mean, we've seen these little, maybe many documentaries or uh, exposés on some of these preachers that would uh, might go into this thing as a business. And, and um, especially some of the, the healer types where... It's just a scam from day one. I mean, they'll, whether they came up with it or somebody taught them, they'll have an earpiece in, they'll have somebody in the crowd, they'll collect previous information. And this guy with a uh, broken foot, you know, and it's not healed right, somebody will say, um, you know, I understand you got, God's telling me you have a foot issue. And he just told the other person, one of the staff, an hour before, he's got a foot issue. And there's an earpiece in, and this guy's really working it, and he's getting a pile of money by deceiving people. He's doing it on purpose. 
And then there are the, <clears throat> the other kind, like we had talked about before. Maybe it's a, just a small little old country church, and you get this old guy that's uh, preaching for free, but yet he's still telling the same lie that the mega church guy's telling. Still telling a lie. And again, you know, like I mentioned that example, this guy might be saying, hey, look, we're the few. This is evidence that we're believers because we're the few. And they might even get persecuted for something. And they'll use that as evidence. But the, these are things that um, make the wolf in sheep's clothing a little bit harder to deal with in some of these instances. <clears throat> so we can, we can relate that to the subject here of having to do with a false teacher, whether or not he's lying on purpose or just he's deceived. Speaking of that, I quoted a text just off the top of my head. We'll go to it this week, 2 Timothy 3. We'll re read a few verses after, just kind of grab the context some. Um, we've read this verse many times over the years. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. But evil men and seducers, notice, no, okay, first of all, evil men. You know, I, I just need to apply something here that we've talked about for years. Uh, we can't leave out, and, and, and I think we should primarily focus on when we say evil men, it's talking about in reference to religion and um, wrong doctrine, false religion. Evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue in the things which I have taught you, Paul writing Timothy, and that you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from a babe you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed, it's inspired, right? And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be uh, perfected, which has to do with uh, maturity or a completeness and a growth, thoroughly furnished to every good work. So this is the way that it works, how that God gets people ready uh, whether they be one that pastors, teaches, or just a church member that witnesses and, and deals with one another in the church. Either way, this is how he does it. He teaches, and at the same time, he warns about evil men and seducers. I'll quote something real quick out of Luke. If you're writing down references, it's Luke 6.26. Christ is uh, dishing out some woes to people as he's preaching. He says, Woe to you when all men shall speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. So there's this idea about fame and influence and the amount of people that are gathered under a teacher. And that judgment is not perfect, but when you, as I alluded to in the negative, when you see a, maybe a small conservative little church way out in the middle of nowhere, they've only got like six people, and they'd say, I think that's evidence that we are um, the true church. Well, it might be you're just in a bad location. <laughs> you're not close to the highway where people have access. Um, but then, then on the other hand, you have this mega church, and they've got like 6,000 members. Um, I mean, right away, I'm thinking, this is a bad sign. You know, what is this guy saying to get that many people in there? Um, so you've got those type churches too. And so the one that stands and represents in the mega church, or, or not even the mega church, the larger church, um, people speak well of them. Now, there might be a few people that don't like him, and it might not be about the gospel. It might be about um, they didn't recognize them or didn't appoint them to their staff or their worship team or whatever um, 
programs they have going. Who knows? It's a lot of personality issues in those big churches. Uh, it's a big power struggle in a lot of churches on who gets to do what and say what and gets noticed. But people like, say for example, we get an easy one like Billy Graham. Uh, famous. Millions, uh, if not uh, at least a billion people have liked him and watched him and said, yeah, that's a good dude. And they speak well of him. Um, whoa, you know, woe unto you. This is, got to be aware of those type people. So entering in on the numbers game, using that as part of the evidence of judging, you still have to do that in wisdom. Mainly it's what's said out of the mouth. And I think that's primarily what's pressed in our text here. So think of that in the context of teachers who say what unbelievers want to hear. And remember about the promise of persecution, um, that those that speak the truth will be hated, which is the opposite of being spoken well of. And this all has to do, of course, with the offense of the cross. Let's go to Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Now we're getting close to being done. Let's look at verses, uh, start in verse 6. Very familiar with this. Um, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you unto the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. This other gospel I just said is, is another gospel. He says it's not, a, it's not another. And there's not much um, commentary there except at the end of this sentence. But some are troubling you and desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's why it's not another. It's perverted into another that won't work. It's not good news. The gospel is good news, but this other gospel is not good news. And it's a perversion or a twisting of the scripture to make it another gospel, void it out, add works to grace, or talk about a failed insufficiency in the person and work of Christ. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides what we preached to you, in other words, before the original gospel, let him be cursed or, uh, or anathema or damned. So Paul here is putting the gospel over him. The truth is more important than him. He says even if, he's including himself here, or whatever people might think about angels, he said it doesn't matter who says it. They're to be damned if they preach another gospel. Well, he repeats it again. It's so important. Verse 9, as we said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches a gospel to you besides what you have received, in other words, originally, which, which doesn't include maybe some falsity before, whether it be law or paganism, either one, when God actually really did convert the ones that he's talking to that are converted, that gospel he says that they preach something else, let them be accursed. Verse 10, for because uh, now do I persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? A false teacher most of the time, I think, has this thing in his mind that he wants to please men, at least the ones that he wants to get into the church to continue to grow the church and to give him money that might agree with him about the same false gospel. Men-pleasers, ear-ticklers, right? He says, for if I yet pleased men... I would not be a servant of Christ. That would be a contradiction. Because 
preaching the gospel is not pleasing men, it's offending them with the truth is what it's doing, and that's not very pleasing. God has to be the one that opens the mind so that they're not offended by the gospel. The very contrary idea, they love the gospel, and they're actually offended by their false gospel that they cast away. And brothers, I make known to you the gospel which was preached by me, that it is not according to man. Verse 12, for I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, in other words, from man, except by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's not a humanism thing. It doesn't have anything to do with man in reference to the remedy in salvation. So we are looking, as we look at and discern and, and are trying to find out who a true preacher is versus a false preacher, a true uh, teacher versus a false teacher. Here the word prophet is used, and we're going we're gonna to look more into that uh, in, the, in the future. But wh what, are, what are we looking for? What are they saying about some of the key elements of the gospel of Christ? We talked about the gospel is the person and the work of Christ, right? What does that concern? Right away, it gets into the idea of, of, uh, of righteousness. We know about concerning the gospel, it has to do with the reason that it's the power of God and the salvation, Romans 1.17, is because in it, in the gospel, that's the power of God and the salvation, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And this has to do with the righteousness that Christ came that was purposed to come and establish, to bring in, to earn, to merit by his doing and dying and take that merit and give it to by way of the vehicle of imputation, a legal transfer, a reckoning to the account of, a charging positively to the account of the elect so that that's an imputation, so that they can be justified by that imputation of righteousness, that gift package that Christ merited, and be declared justified or perfectly righteous because of the righteousness of another, based on his effectual, finished, sufficient, accomplished, substitutionary atonement that he accomplished. That we'll get into what, what, what are the teachers or preachers or writers or even people on Facebook posting about how can God be both a just God and a Savior? Uh, him being just when he justifies. On what ground? You get the idea, and we're going to dig more into that as time goes on. So turn also for the last text, um, 1 Timothy 4. And verse 1, Therefore I solemnly witness before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to be the judge, Christ is going to be the judge. Here it says, He's going to be the judge of the living and the dead according to His appearance and His kingdom. Preach the word, here's the exhortation, Preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, Four, verse 3, a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They can't deal with it. They can't take it. They can't listen. They don't have the attention span or they are offended so much by it. They don't want to hear it. Willfully ignorant. They can't endure, won't endure sound doctrine, but will heap to, to themselves. They'll heap up teachers to themselves. And... Um, this will be in connection with their own, um, their own lusts, and again, their, their spiritual perversions of their own righteousness is what this is dealing with, and they'll have itching ears. They want their ears tickled. You know, there's that idea there in um, Isaiah, the old text where it talked about that uh, their ears are waxed gross when somebody's. Ears are clogged with wax. They're itchy and they need tickled. Right? 
I think there's a connection here. Verse 4. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned to myths, which of course are not true, right? Lies, whether they be traditional lies, old tales, you know, stuff that's just been a bunch of baloney passed on from one generation to the next that has some form of authority that they think that really doesn't. And it is not a message that contains in it the righteousness of God revealed in it to make it the power of God and the salvation. All right. You know, another thing I didn't mention, um, it's always where you do messages and you think, well, there's three or four or five other things I could have said I didn't say. Um, this thing of entering into the gate which gate to enter into. We know that man, I mean, this is basic. Man doesn't get credit for going in a certain gate. He's, he's brought in. Well, we've already talked about that some this morning by God's purpose. He's brought in the straight gate, right? He enters in the straight gate. He's caused to by God. And there's a sense in which he's dabbled in the wide gateway before that was on the road to, the path to that wide gate, but he was rescued from that path and from that way and from that gate and put in the right gate. That's where I was mentioning that, um, you know, previous, and this is directly tied to repentance, previous to coming into the right way, previous to that, there was a way that seemed right unto a man and the way was death, and we were on that death path, going to a wide gate church, listen to a wide gate preacher, and um, destruction and death was the only thing that was there. We were rescued from that, passed from death unto life to have the truth revealed to us. Any comments or questions?